Matt, I want to say it, it's uh, congratulations on all the acclaim that you've gotten uh, for Evicted. You have, as everyone in this audience knows, you have genuinely changed the conversation about poverty in this country, and it is an honor to present you with the Chicago Tribune's Heartland Award for nonfiction. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I got to say, you got some uh, you got some reporting chops too. Thank you. It, I it, did. Uh, it's not an best. easy thing to go into a community where you really I don't think you knew much of anyone when you went to Milwaukee to embed yourself uh, there and get not just get to know people, but to become so intimately close to them that yeah. you could get the kind of detail of the stories that you got. How did you how did you gain their trust? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, I just want to say it's really great to be back in the Midwest. Uh, we missed the Midwest so much. Uh, my family's here, so thanks for coming. Um, so uh, putting up with me. So uh, I, I started this work uh, in Milwaukee, and I, I moved to the city, and I rented like this flop house, and I was like, all right, I'm here. How do I go find evicted people? You know, and um, so I opened the uh, the Journal Sentinel one day, and there was a story about a trailer park that was facing all these code violations that the city was going to shut it down, and that would have resulted in this mass eviction. So, like, I just drove down, to, and I was like, hey, can I rent a trailer here? And the landlord was like, absolutely, you know, and, uh, and so, um, and that was Tobin. What and was the going rate? What did, what did a trailer it was, cost? It was 550. 550 uh, utilities mm -hmm. not included for a, a trailer that didn't have any hot water. And I told him, like, hey, I'm a writer. I'm going to write about you in your trailer park. So, like, that gives you an indication, like, what my neighbors were dealing with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then, all right, so you're there, but that doesn't mean people are going to trust you, know you, you know, why wouldn't they shun you? Why would they... Some uh, folks did, Why would yeah. they start telling you stories? Yeah, some folks did. And I remember early on, there was this, uh, I was kind of getting in and getting in. There was like a honeymoon period, right? And then it's just kind of like a, a novelty and a lot of folks talk to you. But then after a while, that wears off. And, um, and so I was in that place where it was kind of like wearing off a little bit, and that's where you really start the work. And... Um, my wife and I had agreed to be a wedding, and then the, the person sprung it on us that it was like a destination wedding, so we had to leave town. And so I was, I was talking to this guy, and he was, uh, he was drunk. And so we were having a good conversation. I was right out on my way out of town for a few weeks, and this guy named Wayne comes up, and he's like, don't talk to him, to say me. Uh, he's a spy for the city, and takes the, the, the drunk guy away. And I was like, I'm, I'm not a spy. I'm a, and he's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, a writer. This is what I do. And he's like, you know, uh, show me the books you've written. So I was like, well, I don't, I don't carry the books around with me, Wayne. You know, like, I was like, but if you, like, let's go look up, let's go look them up on the internet. And he's like, I don't have the internet. I work for a living. <laughs> so I was like, this is going great. You know, and, uh, and he had a lot of influence in the trailer park. And I knew that if I didn't convince him, you know, uh, I, I would have been out. And so I called all the bookstores. I was like, do you have my first book? You know, and like, of course, no one has it. And so, uh, and so then I drove to the Milwaukee Public Library, and I, picked, I checked out my own book. Mm -hmm. And then I drove back to the trailer park, and I showed it to Wayne. And thank God they had kept the dust jacket on it with my picture. And then, uh, then he was cool. Then he made me a ham sandwich. He invited me in, you know. But so so all he those introduce things you to like, others? Those, I mean, just, those, those kind of things just came up over and over and over again and just being earnest. So I remember being, meeting Scott in the trailer park for the first time. And, you know, uh, knocked on his door. I, 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 he learned that I was interested in eviction. He was facing eviction. So we, we made a breakfast date. And, like, from the time it took us to walk from his trailer to my car, he was like, okay, here's my story. Like, I used to be a nurse. I hurt my back. I got hooked on Oxycontin, you know, that developed into full-blown heroin addiction, lost my nursing license, ended up homeless, and that's why I'm moving to the trailer park. So I was like, oh, okay, it's a, let's, yeah, let's get a McMuffin. It's one thing to interview people. I yeah. know that experience. But another, you, you were there day and night. I mean, you lived experiences with, yeah. when you were in the car. Yeah. Uh, you know, how did that, that kind of affinity, do you think, that people were willing to spend that much time with you? <clears throat> I think it matters. I think time matters a lot. And so just spending as much time on the ground as you can seemed to, seemed to matter quite a bit. Just because you, you pick things up and you allow... Yeah, you you allow yourself the ability to see things at two in the morning or one in the morning or seven in the morning, um, 
But it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean like people trust you fully. So I remember Arlene, who I, I would say is kind of the main person that really carries Evicted. Um, years later, we had been to funerals together. We had, we had just been down the line together. We had spent years together. You know, she just leaned over to me and she said, are you sure you don't work for Child Protective Services, which was her biggest fear. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so it just shows you can, you can still learn a lot about folks and spend a lot of time with folks, but it doesn't mean that they are, they're fully crossing a line to, to trust. Mm. There's a, uh, a, a point where you uh, seem to suggest that you feel real strong guilt about what you are doing here. There's a, er, you say, I feel dirty collecting these stories and hardships like so many trophies. <clears throat> yeah. In the new Joan Didion uh, documentary, there's a moment where she's asked when she um, discovered a, a five-year-old who was addicted to heroin. And she responds in her classic, like, just honesty. She's like, it was gold. You know, and that's where the guilt comes in because you you know you you're finding something and you know and you're kind of documenting like the horrors of poverty and like the sadness of it that there's stories that hang on that, but in the in the in the same time you're exposed to that that trauma. I remember this one eviction that I was on. We went in with the sheriffs, and it was really confusing because it was just kids. It was just kids in the house, and we learned that the mom had died. And the kids had just gone living in the house. And so the sheriff just like evicted the kids like any other eviction, moved their stuff onto the, the ground. It was one of those cold, rainy spring days in Milwaukee, changed the locks, and we were on to the next eviction. So it's like from a writer's point, I think you're dealing with this kind of tension between like knowing that that's a really important story, which gives you some sort of like that thing we get when you're a writer, like this is important, but also just balancing that with a just the tragedy and horror of that kind of scene. Mm-hmm. There, well, let me ask you, why do you we, we were talking earlier about it. There are so many things that go into poverty. It can be child welfare, child abuse, yeah. uh, uh, and drug addiction. Why did you decide on, on housing as the piece that you were going to examine? Yeah, I just think we didn't know anything about it. you know. And so we had a lot of stories written on public housing, especially in this city, with Cabrini Green and Robert Taylor. But like only 6% of poor renting families live in public housing today. So it's a really small slice. And then we had a lot of stories on neighborhoods, you know, how gentrifying they're becoming or segregated. But the private rental market where the vast majority of poor folks live today, we just didn't know hardly anything about it. That was one reason. And then the other reason is like I wanted to try to write a book about poverty that wasn't about the poor. So I was looking for something, a narrative device that would allow me to write about folks with means, folks without a, a lot of money, uh, uh, folks in business and government, and I thought eviction does that. Eviction allows me to write about landlords and tenants and social workers and sheriffs, and, and so that was kind of the two motivations. It is kind of a hidden issue. I don't think people really, it, you don't see it often, it's, it doesn't make the television news at night. Uh, you know, in Cook County, 34,000 people are evicted. Those are just sheriff's evictions in a year, about 8,500 8, evictions affecting 34,000 yeah. uh, people. Uh, are places are there places since the book that are that are doing it right? You know, that did something change because of what you wrote about the trauma that happens with? Yeah, yeah we've. I mean, uh, yes. Um, so uh, one quick example. So there's a chapter in the book on, on nuisance ordinances. Uh, this sounds boring, but it's not. Just stay with me. Um, so, you know, when I was in Milwaukee, it looked like women were getting evicted at higher rates than men. And so I went to the landlords that I knew, and I was like, well, what's what explains us? And I got a lot of explanations. The one thing they said is, you got to look into these nuisance ordinances. And I was like, what are those? And they said, okay, if our tenant calls 911 a lot, we get a letter. And it's like, dear Mr. Landlord, you're a nuisance to the city. Uh, and you need to abate this nuisance. And if you don't abate it, it's scary. You can get fined. You can get your property taken away. And the fines have commas in them. And so I said, well, uh, well, Who's calling? And they, they said, well, it's not for noise. It's not for drugs. It's for domestic violence. That's who's calling. And I said, well, uh, what do you do when, when you get a nuisance ordinance? And the landlord's like, we just evict the tenant. There's nothing else we can do. You know, that's how to abate the nuisance. So I went to the Milwaukee Police Department. I said, I need like two years worth of your nuisance ordinances. And they were like, no. And so then I got a lo- I was like, I have a lawyer. And they're like, okay, fine. And so they, they gave us these two years worth. And we crunched the numbers and we learned that the landlords were right. You know, about every four days in Milwaukee, a landlord gets a letter from the city saying, you're a nuisance because of domestic violence-related 911 calls. In over 80% of the cases, they evict the tenant. 
And so we're putting these women in these terrible situations, right? This devil's bargain. And um, so that's the bad news. And the good news is we took that finding to Milwaukee. They changed our law. We worked with the ACLU to start a, a campaign called I Am Not a Nuisance. They've litigated uh, f uh, in Illinois, in Pennsylvania, in Arizona. If you guys have a nuisance ordinance, the ACLU is coming for you. And then we, we got federal law put back on the side of domestic violence survivors right before the election. And so that's kind of a, mm -hmm. an example of just like a, literally like a fact checking. <laughs> there, are two, there are two stories in the book, there are a lot of stories in the book, but there are two that I thought were really uh, compelling, frightening even, and I'd like you to, to talk about them and tell, I, I guess your own personal reaction. One involves a, a trip to a casino, a fire, and a death. Yeah. Uh, so this is my birthday. Uh, and um, I was at a Potawatomi Casino, which is in the middle of Milwaukee, um, and uh, with Shreena and Quentin, who are uh, landlords in the book. My landlords, too. I was renting from them. And, uh, you know, Sharina was playing, uh, playing the tables, and... Uh, and we got a call that, that, uh, that a house was on fire. And, um, and so we, we raced over, and it was, uh, it was a house um, off North Avenue, and, uh, and uh, a, a, baby, a baby died uh, that night in the, in the flames. And um, it was, I think it was the, sa the saddest time uh, in, in my field work, and it was something very difficult to write about. And then it was something difficult to write about uh, just wh where do you tell that story, like from a writer's perspective? Because Sharina, the landlord, was very businesslike in responding yeah. to the fire. You know, so she, you know, she, w she was like, well, do I have to return the tenant's rent money? You know, it was like February 4th is my birthday, so they had just paid rent. Do I have to return the rent money? And this was money? at the scene? I mean, she's having this kind of calculation. No, at, at the scene, she was more just like, what happened... How did this start? You know that kind of thing. And um, but in a, did you have a sense in a self-protective way? How did it start? I or think it was, was. Was there a lot of empathy for the people who had just been sure? Yeah, out? I mean, sure. So Lamar was living in the downstairs uh, apartment that burned, and the upstairs is the, the family had just moved in, and that's um, that's who tragically lost a, a child. And so, like, Sharina would often say, like, I love Lamar, you know, and so she, she had an affection for him. So she, she did worry about that. Just she also just worried about, like, am I going to be on the hook? Um, are, are the police going to call me? You know, th these kind of things that landlords would talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and she dealt with the situation in a very, um, I, I think some readers read, read her responses really cold, where she didn't return the rent money. That's how I read yeah, it. Yeah. Um, and she made sure that she was kind of not liable and moved on, you know. But the other instance, the other story I wanted to ask you to tell also involves Sharina, and it's uh, Sharina and I believe Arlene. They go to court, Sharina is evicting Arlene, <laughs> and then gives her a ride home. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, the eviction business is something, so a lot of us who haven't been evicted, you know, I remember giving this talk once, and this person's like, what do you do when it's the worst day of their life? And I'm like, this is not the worst day of their life, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, that, ca that usually came uh, a lot younger. And, um, and so for some folks, like Arlene has been evicted a, a lot. And even after that eviction, years later, she called Sharina and asked her, like, do you have a place? You know, I'm looking for some place. Um, what was fascinating to me about that drive uh, wasn't necessarily that the drive happened, but what Sharina told Arlene, which is like, so Sharina goes to court with Arlene. Civil court, you don't have an attorney, right? And so if you get arrested in this country, you have a right to an attorney, you have no such right in civil court. So Arlene's in civil court um, without representation. She loses, she gets evicted. She's ordered to be out on a day in early January in Milwaukee, that's a cold, that's a cold eviction. But in the car, Sharina's like really mad that the court commissioner didn't give her all the money she sued this other tenant for. So she was just telling Arlene like how hard it is to be a landlord. Like Arlene's, you know, and it was, uh, it was I think it was December 23rd. And Arlene has two young kids at home, you know, and so th that, that to me was something, I don't know, mysterious. And, mm -hmm. yeah. Sharina, I, it's, there was such an interesting person in the, there are a lot of interesting people, but 
so she goes to Jamaica, she goes to the casino, she's making a pretty good buck, but you don't walk away thinking that she's got a cushy, this is not a cushy job for what you have to do. Did you develop a, a sympathy factor for landlords and what they have to deal with? Yeah, I thought that was my job. You know, I thought that if I wrote a book that was slanted or if I wrote a book that didn't give landlords as much um, shot at, like, capturing their complexity as tenants, then the book would fail. And so, you know, Sharina and every other landlord has this kind of story. I used to be nice, <laughs> but... And then what, after comes out, what comes after the but is, like, a serious thing. Like, I used to be nice, but then one time I evicted tenants and they stuffed socks down the sink and they turned on the water before they left. You know, I used to be nice, but then a tenant pulled a gun on me. You know, um, you know and, and I think that for us, real reform has to come through landlord. That's where most low-income families live. So I think, that's, I think that my job was like developing sympathy for her. But I think that like writing a book about tenants and landlords makes us ask bigger moral questions about how we're implicated in poverty too. You know, and so, you know, poverty isn't just a product of low incomes, it's also a product of extractive markets. And I think that where we need to go with the poverty debate is ask like, how are my neighborhoods, the safety of my neighborhoods, or the quality of my kids' schools, or the benefits that I get to uh, claim on my tax records, not just privileges, but actually intimately tied to the lack of those things in certain areas like the South Side or the West Side of Chicago. Mm -hmm. um. The subtitle is Poverty and Profit <coughs> right. in, the, in, in our cities, uh, as, as though they are in conflict. And I go back to that, you know, that particular case of uh, the landlord. Is there, to what ex extent did you find that there was profiteering on poverty? And were there particular ways that you say, no, we should try and curb this? Yeah, I mean, when I started this work, I, I was like, why, why would you buy a duplex in inner city Milwaukee? Like, why would you buy a multi-unit in West Lawn, you know? But then when I finished this work, I was like, oh, why wouldn't you do that? Uh, because you, you can make substantial profits. And this isn't just like an ethnographic observation, this is also a statistical one. So the census has this survey of landlords that they did a few years ago that like, no one's looked into. So we looked into it. And what we found is that if you're a landlord in a poor neighborhood, almost everywhere in the country, except like really hot markets like New York and Seattle, your profits are much bigger than if you're a landlord in a middle class neighborhood. And the reason is really simple, your mortgage bills and your property taxes are a lot lower, but your rents aren't that much lower. So if you're renting a property in like the worst neighborhood in Milwaukee, you're, you're spending about $50 less every month than like the median rent in the city. So, not that, so you're getting a lot worse housing and a lot worse neighborhood, but you're not paying that much less. And so the, the margins are just much bigger. And so like, you know, Sharina rented exclusively to poor folks. She had only been a landlord for four years. She had, I think, 30 units, and she made, she made six figures just, just on that. And you're right, her, her work wasn't easy and it wasn't cushy, but she was, she was quite successful at it. She lived a comfortable life. How many of you spend 70% uh, of your income on housing? Yeah, there's the problem. How many of you spend 50% of your income? Nobody, but that's what you found, right? Yes, and that's yeah. the sad part is like that's n our new normal. And so um, most poor renting families today spend at least 50% of their income on housing costs, and about one in four poor renting families in America spend over 70% of their income uh, just on rent and utilities. You know, and just like that's a hard thing to imagine, like 70% of your income is gone at the beginning of the month if you want a roof over your head in hot water you know, if you're living under those conditions, you don't need to, like, make a huge mistake or have, like, a big emergency wash over your life to get evicted. Something really small can do it. And the recipe for this is really simple. It has three ingredients. Like, incomes for Americans of modest means have been flat, but housing costs have soared. So between 1995 and today, median rents have increased by over 70% in America. There's this growing gap between what poor folks are bringing in and what they have to pay for basic shelter. And then the third ingredient is like, well, where's public housing or housing assistance? Where's any kind of help? And the answer is it's there and it works, 
but it's only for the lucky minority of poor families today. So only about one in four families in America who qualify for any kind of housing assistance get it. And the unlucky majority, the 75%, receive, um, it's a technical term, nothing, nothing. <laughs> um, and the waiting list for public housing today, like in big cities like this one, it's not counted in years anymore, it's counted in decades. So I've got two young kids. If I applied for public housing today in Washington, D.C., I'd be a grandfather by the time my application was reviewed. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's us now. Yeah. You wrote an op-ed in the Chicago Tribune in 2010. I think about the time you, you would have been just, were you in the midst of your research or wrapping up? Right, wrapping up, yeah. Uh, uh, suggesting that we were going to see, was it, was it the McDonaldization or there was a different term? Walmartization. Walmartization. I knew it was one of those It was a while uh, ago. That the uh, what we we're going to see in economic crisis was big landlords taking more properties and smaller landlords being squeezed out, and as a result, tenants feeling more of a squeeze. Did, did that happen? Has there been? Have we seen since that chaotic time? Uh, there's been it's a, it's, a, it's a more stable economy now, but not for everybody. Right. Has it been a benefit for renters, or as a what you expected to happen happened? I, I think I. Th think so. So, you know, the argument was like, okay, if you look at the foreclosure crisis, a lot of the media story came out, coming out of that is like, it's like stock in California. It's like these homeowners bought above their means, they went underwater. But like, in some areas of the country, like landlords took a huge hit during the foreclosure crisis. So like in LA, for example, one of two foreclosures was a rental property. So the question is like, who's lo who lost? You know, who lost the property? And from what I was seeing on the ground anyways, it was like the small landlords. You know, they got in the business to put Junior through college, you know, it went under. But at the same time, like, that was a really, the foreclosure crisis was a really great time to be a landlord because properties dropped 27% on average if they were foreclosed, but rents didn't go down. So you could have the opportunity to buy under market, but rent at market value. But then you had this other problem where like banks went insolvent, right? And they started like increasing like lending standards. Like now you have to pay 20% down, 30% down. One landlord that I met told me banks went from stupid to stupid. They gave out everyone loans and they didn't give out anyone loans. So the question is like who has the opportunity to take advantage of that really awesome kind of market situation from a landlord's perspective? And I think the answer was uh, bigger landlords, you know, that have more kind of like money in their coffers and are able to like uh, buy things out of cash or put that down. So I went looking for like the data just didn't come mm -hmm. up empty, and I thought, I still don't think this is happening, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll write an op-ed and see if it catches. And now what we've been seeing is like all these news stories last year about like hedge funds and uh, uh, other kind of large kind of money corporations buying up all these foreclosed properties. So I think it, it has happened. I think the, the data that would really not allow us to nail the question doesn't exist, mm -hmm. or is harder to, to get our hands on. Yeah. It's been a few years since you were there, since you were doing the research. I know you, shel you set up uh, JustShelter.org and uh, found the Evicted uh, Book Foundation yeah, yeah. to try and uh, to help some of the people that you wrote about. How much, how much do you keep in touch with those folks, and how are they doing? A, a lot. I think I, uh, someone from Milwaukee calls me about every day. And so, so the family, our, our family has set up a little uh, foundation for the folks in the book, and we've done things like uh, paid off a bunch of debt, we've sent kids to community college, we've stabilized people's housing situations, um, we've just, we've, uh, we've served as a lot of emergency aid, you know, when things kind of go rough, and so that's been, that's been wonderful, that's been an honor, and that's been like something that um, we're really proud of, and, um, and the folks are doing mixed, you know, they're doing mixed, and so like Vanetta is doing great, uh, she, she served her time, this was a woman who committed an armed robbery, to try to pay the rent, you know, because she was so terrified of her kids being on the streets. Uh, so she did her time, she did 18 months, I think, um, and she came out and she just, even though she had a felony conviction, she, she found jobs, she got married, um, she's, she's, she's working and struggling, but I think she's in a, in a much better place. Um, L Lorraine found this amazing apartment in Milwaukee that the foundation helped her uh, secure and like has this beautiful view of the city and she's doing much more securely now. And then some folks aren't, aren't with us anymore. You know, some folks have passed and, uh, and some folks have had uh, different kinds of hardships along the way. Mm -hmm. There's a point. There's a point in the book that you talk about the, the left-right dynamic that uh, the left 
looks at poverty and tends, tends to think of uh, structural obstacles that people face. Yeah. The right tends to look at <coughs> personal deficiencies. Yeah. And you, didn't, you weren't buying into either one. I think they both do the same thing, which is uh, uh, absolve us of responsibility. How so? Because, you know, if, you're, if you like lean right, you could say, oh, this person is poor because they made bad decisions. They had a kid outside of wedlock. They didn't get the right kind of education. And if you lean left, you say, oh, uh, there's, a, there's, there's so much poverty in America because, and then we have these big words, because deindustrialization or neoliberalism, you know, or welfare reform. And what both of those ways, but what those kind of theories, which are usually pitted against one another, what they have in common is like, that has nothing to do with me as a person, right? It's either like, it's either like we've inherited this kind of history or people have done things they shouldn't have done. And um, what if we looked at poverty as a relationship? You know, what, what if we said, you know, we probably have something to do with this. So like, how can we make this kind of really tangible? So like, let's just think about like housing policy. So every year we spend about $40 billion on direct housing assistance to the needy, like public housing, Section 8. We spend about $150 billion on like homeowner tax subsidies, you know, like especially the mortgage interest deduction, which in a few years will cost us about $100 billion a year. Most of the mortgage interest deduction goes to families with six-figure incomes because you, like, you have more income, you can have a bigger home. Bigger home, you can take a bigger deduction. Um, most white families own their home and thus like, are qualified for this you know, really amazing uh, cutaway in the tax code. Most black and Latino families, because of our legacy of racial discrimination, don't. And so it's like, really hard to think of like, a housing policy that more like, unblushingly amplifies our racial and economic inequality than our current housing policy does. We give most to families that need it the least and nothing to families that need it the most. And that's like related, you know? That's related. You know, we don't have enough. Those waiting lists are so long for families that are spending 60, 70, 80% of their income on housing costs, in part because we're spending so much to benefit wealthy homeowners. So like, that's where I think the normal poverty debate misses. Like it misses like, us, you know? Mm -hmm. So what would you do? I mean, you, you, you do talk about uh, changing the power dynamic between landlord and renter. It seems like the, the big suggestion, the major suggestion in the book is a much broader housing voucher program. Uh, how would it work and has it gotten any traction? Yeah, so, so how would it work and has it gotten any traction? Um, so, the, uh, so the good news is that there's all these programs that you have that work. Like when families finally receive a housing voucher after like years and years on the waiting list, when they get this ticket that allows them to pay only 30% of their income on rent instead of 70 or 80, they do one consistent thing with their free up income. They uh, go to the grocery store. They buy more food and their kids become like healthier. They move less. They move into better neighborhoods. They work uh, for the lucky minority of poor folks that benefit from them today. So one idea is to take that program and expand it to everyone below the poverty line, you know? And so you could, if you qualified for the system, you could get that ticket, you could live anywhere you wanted as long as your housing wasn't too expensive or too shoddy. And you would finally receive that that you feel when you're like hitting our standard of affordability. And so we don't need to outsmart the problem. We don't need to come up with like new solutions. It's like we need to out hate it, you know what I mean? And so, so that's going to take like a massive amount of political will, and um, there's not a lot going on today in Washington. Um, but there's a in, in that in that respect, there's a lot going on. But uh, in the other, um, but cities have stepped up. You know, cities have learned how to to raise revenue. So for C Seattle, for example, last year passed passed a ha housing levy where they've asked homeowners in the city to pay a little bit more every year in property taxes to fund affordable housing because, and this is how they tell, this is how they talk about it, like we don't want to be San Francisco. Like we value economic diversity in our city. And they're gonna raise $270 million over 70 years, or seven years, excuse me, and it's gonna go directly to affordable housing programs. So I think cities like that are stepping up and making a difference. But for us to get like real change, for us to like address this problem at scale, we have to have Washington. Mm -hmm. You'd probably run into some resistance to a vastly expanded housing assistance program. One of them is to Shire is Sharina, 
Your landlord, to quote her, rent assistance is a pain in the ass. Yeah, yeah. What does she mean? She means that like when inspectors come, they're really nitpicky. And so she has a point, you know? And so, you know, um, some properties Sharina had, she was like, okay, they can pass the section, in, you know, um, inspection. But a lot of them couldn't pass that inspection. And, you know, some parts of the housing code are really essential to let you like human dignity and kids' health, but a lot of it's not. And so I think this is where we could really listen to landlords and say like, okay, like, why aren't you taking vouchers? Because landlords don't have to in most parts of the country. And in some of our expensive cities, the return rate on vouchers is embarrassingly high. Like in Portland, Oregon, 60% of families that finally get a voucher, they can't find a place to use it. They have to give it back. And so, um, so I think we can kind of figure out like how to make this program. So is that, I'm sorry, is that because landlords just don't want to take them? They just don't want to deal with them? That the housing is there, but the willingness to deal with all the government stuff that you got to deal with, that, but yeah. what Sharina's, yeah. it's a pain in the ass. Yeah, so the research suggests there's three things going on. One, in high cost cities, they, they, the vouchers aren't worth it. You know, they don't pay as much as you could to rent just for someone that doesn't have a voucher. The second is the housing inspection, the pain in the ass point. Or can we say ass in a church? I don't yeah, know. I okay. So. Um, uh. Uh, where it's just like, it's onerous, it's kind of federal regulation. And the third is just racist. You know, there's just like landlords make assumptions about families based on, you know, them having a voucher or not. I, I would expect the, the argument that you get to a vastly expanded program would be that fewer landlords would want to participate, that the housing wouldn't be there. And you'd also get an argument that it'd be a disincentive to work. Would you right. address those? Yeah, so with respect to the first one, a lot of landlords like the proposal of like more housing vouchers. They don't agree with all my proposals in the book, but a lot of landlords I've met, they like this because it is a compromise with landlords. It says, okay, we will subsidize your income if you provide quality housing to this family. And so I think that we might be able to get more buy-in. Some cities have chosen like to stick over the carrot with that and made like made uh, what's called source of income discrimination illegal, saying you can't discriminate against folks based on race or other attributes. You shouldn't be able to discriminate against them based on income. You know, so some folks have gone that way. And other folks have just been like, okay, let's really figure out why landlords are turning these folks away and try to bring them around the table. So I think there's a lot of different kind of approaches we could, we could get at that. On the disincentive to work piece, it's like a totally fair question. And a lot of us researchers have spent a lot of time on that question. And there are a few studies that show that when families receive a housing assistance, they also experience a slight reduction in work hours. They don't stop working, they just work a little less. I think they want to spend more time with their kids. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot more studies, they don't find any relationship between those things. And there's like me call it a null relationship. And I think that the, tr the truth is like the status quo is a much bigger threat to self-sufficiency than any like affordable housing program can be. Mm -hmm. Like families crushed by the high cost of housing. They can't afford job training or community college classes to get plugged in. Most can't like afford, to, like many families can't afford to stay in their place long enough just to hold down a job. And then there's just like the more human consideration of how much brain power and talent and creativity we just squander because we ask so many of our neighbors to spend so much of their potential figuring out like, how am I gonna make rent this month or where am I gonna live after like, mm -hmm. I'm inevitably evicted. Yeah. Uh, we touched on just shelter.org, but I wanna make sure that you get a chance to tell people exactly how they could get involved. If they, if either in Chicago, if you wanna suggest what organizations or how with, with your organization they can contribute. Yeah, so there's an organization that uh, my family and I started. It's called JustShelter.org. And it's basically, um, it recognizes that there are all these organizations around the country just putting in work, driving down family homelessness, preserving affordable housing, fighting evictions. And so if you wanted to get involved or if you just wanted to learn about like what the crisis looks like in Chicago, you can go to this website called JustShelter.org. You can click on uh, the map and you can just get plugged in with your time or money or just, just learn more. So it's, it's kind of a catalog or a, um, what do you call, a clearinghouse for community organizations all around the country just doing this good work. Yeah, good. What are you working on now? We were talking a little bit about uh, uh, research that might touch on Chicago and other cities. So we have, uh, we have a project right now, it's called the Eviction Lab. 
and it collects uh, every single eviction in America. So for the last year and a half, I've been on the road, and you go to Houston or New Orleans or LA, and you know, folks are like, well, what's eviction like in my city? Like, how are we doing? Like, and we don't, we have no idea. Like, what's the national eviction rate? We have no, I we have no idea. Like, what's, uh, who evicts more people than any other city? Who evicts the less? You know, where, where are evictions happening in our cities? Uh, are they going up and down? Which laws work? We have no idea. We have just no idea. And so we're trying to, we're trying to get at that. So we've, we've managed to collect every single eviction in America, going back to 2000, 66 million eviction records. And we're cleaning them, and we're going to publicize them as, as quickly as we, we can. Mm -hmm. so. Any insights uh, so far? So one of the biggest insights uh, that have come just from a preliminary cut of the data is it's not just a city's issue. You know, so if you look at states, you know, you see evictions clustered in, you know, uh, in Chicago, but you also kind of see them in suburban areas, and you see them in poor rural communities, and you see this problem not just kind of an urban issue. I think there's also, this is a little, I'm just going to say it, um, but we don't know yet. There's not a, when we talk about displacement, we often talk about gentrification. But most evictions in almost every city we've looked at, they don't, they're not taking place in gentrifying neighborhoods. They're in ungentrifying, really poor neighborhoods where even mm -hmm. their poor folks can't afford a roof over their head. Mm -hmm. We have some good questions from the audience that I want to ask you. Uh, did you ever feel in danger while doing all of your interviews? Not really. Um, there are a few things that happened. Uh, rooming house got shot uh, twice, um, and and things like that. But I, I, I never felt I never felt in danger. In part because I had this like amazing roommate um, that I lived with in the inner city named Officer Wu, who was like way too protective of me, and um, and so uh, which is really bad when you're trying to do this kind of work, you know? Because he was like he just. He felt like he was his uh, my Virgil uh, to Milwaukee, and so um, yeah. So I, I I never felt I never felt in danger. I think that like what you learn quickly when you're a white person doing work in poor black communities is like you have this massive amount of privilege, and you know um, you're uniquely shielded and protected um, in those communities. You know. uh, in your research, did you encounter policies unique to the state of Wisconsin? Unique to Wisconsin, I think that the one reason I wanted to write about Milwaukee was because like it's not that unique, you know. And if you write about housing in New York City or San Francisco, you're writing about like a really unique ecosystem. But if you write a book about Milwaukee, I think you got a shot at representing the experiences of folks like in Indianapolis and Chicago and Cleveland and throughout the Rust Belt, but throughout like most cities in America, their laws are pretty not unique, and their housing situation is pretty not unique. Yeah. Did Milwaukee step up? Did, and when they, when they saw the book, they saw what was going on there. Was there, there was anybody in Milwaukee that turned around and said, we got to do something very differently? And the, the oh. newspaper stepped up in a big way and started writing about these issues. Um, I, what, did I, it, what did it do? Well, we were talking about this in the back. So, mm -hmm. you know, they, they put this amazing reporter named Kerry Spivak on like a housing beat, and he's just produced all this incredible reporting about housing and, um, and bad behavior among some property uh, owners in, in Milwaukee. That's been really inspiring. I've met with um, the mayor and, and folks in the city, and we've kind of, and I've met with the, with the governor of, of Wisconsin too, and, uh, and talked to the issues. I, so, I mean, I think we've started a conversation. I think step, the stepping up, like the proof's in the, in the pudding. Yeah, that was a setup. I know Kerry, he's a great reporter. Mm -hmm, yeah, he okay, great. really good yeah. work. I'm glad to see that. Are there uh, countries or places in the U.S. that serve as models? Countries is easy que the easy question, and uh, because it's like yeah, like almost everywhere else, you know, it's like <laughs> like Canada, the U.K. They don't have the mortgage interest deduction. They have similar rates as homeownerships in the United States. Um, if you get evicted in France. Um, you have someone called a hosier who's like a mediator. It's like, what's your perspective? Tonight? What's your perspective, landlord? Can we work together? We have nothing like that here. Um, Amsterdam, 50% of housing is, is social housing. I mean, even with all the reporting that you see coming out of the UK about the housing crisis in London, we would kill to have those eviction rates. We would be like, we are, we'd get like the Nobel Peace Prize if we had those kind of eviction rates. And so I think that we can learn a lot from other countries. The right to attorneys and housing court it's not just something that's in like Sweden and Switzerland, like Azerbaijan has that, Zambia has that, 
And so like we're kind of behind on that one. And so that's, that's right. Um, and then here in the United States, it's like absolutely, you know, and so we talked about Seattle, like Tacoma, Washington, the school district and the um, housing authority are working together because they realized that Tacoma public school system had a 114% residential turnover rate. There's so much like instability in their schools and they were like, we're gonna cut that in half. They did. Um, you see health systems stepping up and saying like, oh, like the top 5% of hospital users are actually consuming 50% of our healthcare cost. We should probably do something about that. Who are those people? Oh, they're like the homeless, you know? And so you've seen these big health systems kind of step up and get into the, the housing game. And then you've seen, you've seen like really creative questions about like eviction records. Like how open should they be? Like um, should, should they be public for 20 years online? Should, should, uh, should that information um, be so accessible? And that really matters because, you know, that's a big screening technique for landlords and for public housing authorities. So a lot of our public housing authorities are like systematically denying housing help to families that need it the most. Yeah. So. The, uh, I mean, the big change in Chicago and, and a number of other cities was the, the, the demolition of uh, public housing, the high rise towers. Right. Uh, so it did take a lot of housing out of public ownership and right. it relied on private ownership. Is there a way in which that that may have been a mistake? I think the biggest mistake <laughs> There's a lot of mistakes. Um, the first mistake was uh, segregating uh, low-income uh, black folks in the city to such a degree that happened here and happened in St. Louis. I mean, that was just a tremendous, <laughs> tremendously wrong, morally bankrupt thing to do. Um, the second mistake was defunding public housing. And so when you read this, the accounts of folks that moved into public housing, we often forget they moved from the slums. You know? And so a lot of the, the first accounts of folks moving into Cabrini or Robert Taylor were like, this is amazing. Like, this is like a resort. Thank you. And then we just decided to gut its funding you know, and, and let these towers fall into this incredible uh, disarray. And so the idea of public housing wasn't a failure. But the way we did it was such a failure on so many multiple steps. Um, and I think we have learned from that. And so we, now we do public housing a lot better. We do scattered site housing. We, we, uh, we distribute it across neighborhoods. Um, Although I, d I don't know, you know I, I bet many people in Chicago would say we did not uh, help in desegregation through that. It may have been more a resegregation with assistance. Are there, are there ways that housing assistance can actually uh, help with integration of communities? Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's interesting, you know. So when folks get, so the housing voucher was designed with this in, in mind. And so uh, it was designed to say, you can take a housing voucher, you can live wherever you want. You know, you don't have to live in this building, live wherever you want. And what we've seen is pr pretty small returns on that. So when folks get a housing voucher, where they live is like a slightly nicer, still poor neighborhood. That's kind of where mm -hmm. they, they move to. And then I think there's a, there's a lot of reasons for that. There's also these tensions between expanding affordable housing options and desegregating in our cities. So a few months ago, I was meeting with the commissioner of the Houston Housing Authority. And he had money to build affordable housing units. So he's like, I'm going to build 1,000 affordable housing units in these poor neighborhoods. You can you build in neighborhoods that are low income, you can build more units. So HUD in Washington was like, you can't do that. That's not affirmatively furthering fair housing. So the commissioner was like, okay, I'm gonna build 350 units in uh, this kind of middle class white neighborhood. Um, it's not 1,000 units, but it's for 300, those 350 families, it's gonna make a big difference. So then there was a NIMBY result, revolt, you know, for folks that are living in those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And they put all this pressure on the mayor, and the mayor finally, um, caved, or, or listen to his constituents, however you want to write that sentence, and, um, and uh, said, you're not going to build this here. And so HUD gave the mayor of Houston, who happens to be an African-American man, a, a civil rights suit, and there's no new housing in Houston. Mm -hmm. And so I think this gets to the tension between like local governments, federal governments, and this kind of like, these two huge issues that we're confronting, the mm -hmm. segregation of our cities and the lack of affordable housing. That goes to the next question from the audience. What is the government's responsibility to provide housing for the poor? 
Mm. I'm not sure if that's asked skeptically or affirmatively. Yeah. So um, I think without stable shelter, like everything else falls apart. So whatever you care about, the lack of affordable housing rests at the, the root of that problem. You know, if you care about like sp spending responsibly, we could spend smart or we could spend stupid. Like we could spend on affordable housing or pay for higher rates of asthma and depression. Like we can choose. Uh, we could spend um, we could spend on uh, stabilizing school communities, letting students like reach their full potential in our public schools, or we cannot. And so, um, education, health, crime reduction. We know that like neighborhoods with more evictions have higher rates of violent crime the next year. Uh, so, in that aspect, I think it's it's absolutely essential. But then it's like. <sighs> You know, like we've affirmed things in this country to be certain rights, right? Like we've affirmed provision in old age, access to basic nutrition, uh, 12 years of education to be rights, because we believe those things are fundamental to human flourishing. And it's pretty impossible to argue that housing isn't fundamental to human flourishing. Mm -hmm. So I think it should be a right in this country, because without it, good luck fixing anything else. And so I think that the government's responsibility is, yeah. And I just, like, I have to return my, to my earlier point. We have a universal housing program in the country. It's like an entitlement program. It's just not for poor people. It's for homeowners. Yeah. May not be around much longer. They're It'll really be around. It'll be around. Yeah. Last question from the audience. As someone who was really disturbed by the inequality described by your book, what can I do to affect change? Um, I think... I don't know. It depends what you're good at. You know, and I think that we can all kind of find ways to take our talents and who we are and kind of, you know, put our, we our shoulder to the wheel on this. So, you know, if, if you're an artist, you know, you can work on representing these stories uh, in your art. If you're a nurse or work in medicine, you can think of volunteering in underserved communities. If you're a journalist, you know, you could think of really covering these stories uh, in depth. If you're a business owner, you can really consider like, do I have to care that someone did time in a cage when he was 20 years old to hire this person like today? I think there's a lot of things we can do just on our everyday basis. But then I think the question that we all have to wrestle with is just like, you know, uh, what kind of country we wanna live in? And like, are we okay with this social contract? And how are my privileges and my benefits and my safety and my affluence uh, not just different but intimately connected uh, with this problem? And, and am I okay with that? Mm -hmm. So that's something like saying, yes, in my backyard. Like, I'm okay with this public housing unit in my, in my neighborhood. And it might affect my property values, but you know, how else are we gonna live? I don't mm -hmm. think we get to call ourselves progressives if that progressiveness doesn't come with some sort of s sacrifice. Matt, last question for you to bring this back uh, to you. you. You saw so much. You saw chaotic situations. You saw them right up close. How did, it, how did all this uh, really affect you personally? Yeah, I think it, it was bad, um, hard on the marriage. Um, I think that, you know, when you see like Jory's, you know, our lean son Jory come from from school and you see him look at this new eviction scene that he wasn't expecting and none of us were, and you see him like, like not ask a question, not run to get a toy, just turn around and go outside, you know? Like that's that's really hard to see, and I think that um, I think that I saw a lot of pain, but I also saw like just a lot of like humor and spunk and like brilliance in the face of adversity. Like I remember uh, I remember this one time. Um, there's m my favorite scene in the book is when uh, Crystal and Vanetta, these two women, homeless. They just met at a homeless shelter. And uh, they were, we were eat, eating at McDonald's, and this kid walks in, he's like nine, eight or nine, and he looks just roughed up, you know? He's got dirty clothes on, looks like someone had hit him. And he doesn't, he doesn't like go up to order, he goes around to the table looking for scraps. And so like Crystal, who's 18 and homeless, you know, she turns to Vanetta and she's like, uh, what you got? 
And these two women pulled their change and they bought this boy lunch and sent him on his way. And I just, that was a beautiful scene to me. And I think it reminded me how gracefully uh, people refuse to be reduced to their uh, hardships. Matt, congratulations on Thank your you. work. It's, it's, uh, really it's nice beautifully be written, Thank it's you. wonderfully reported, and it's impactful. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you so much. Yeah, thank you.